OK, so, uh, so in the second part, we're going to look at something uh, which builds uh, uh, upon what we, we, we discussed about potential energy surfaces. And this has to do, so basically, we looked at equilibrium structures. And now we, we make a little bit of progress by discussing what happens if you bring a system slightly out of equilibrium. Uh, and this is a very simple way of doing it. That means uh, uh, looking at elastic properties. So if you compress something, if you stretch something, what happens? OK, so the simplest way to uh, uh, look basically around equilibrium. So we are looking not at the meaning of the potential well, but we're just uh, next to it. OK? Uh, so uh, I don't know how many of you are interested in these calculations, but you know they are interesting. Uh, and they, uh, I think the bottom line is that the techniques uh, I would like to introduce they are also used to study uh, systems uh, under finite uh, 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 pressure or a finite strain conditions. And that, I think, is quite useful. Uh, for, for experiments. So you, you can simulate actually what happens uh, under finite pressure, for instance. Uh, so uh, when I, I talk about the elastic properties, I, I want to you know, make sure that we're all on the same page. So we will not uh, discuss this part, which is awful. Uh, so we'll only stay in the side of, uh, on the side of elastic properties, so linear elasticity. So just to make a, uh, uh, the difference clear, uh, if you look at the stress and the strain on a material, on a sample, okay, you can make a plot like that, uh, and uh, you have typically a region where this curve is linear okay, for a certain class of solids, which are called uh, brittle solids. Okay? Uh, an example of brittle solid is, uh, you know, to, to use an example that uh, people like here, uh, is uh, uh, oxides, perovskites, and uh, I don't know, cuprates. Uh, so they would be uh, uh, linear uh, elastic, basically stress strain uh, relations until it breaks. All right? Then there is another class of solids uh, which are called ductile. Uh, so those uh, have uh, again a linear slope. Typically the proportional coefficient is smaller. Okay? And uh, at, that, at some point basically uh, the behavior will deviate from linearity and all kinds of things will happen here. Uh, so this is the point uh, where basically, uh, uh, so me just an example, this is uh, something like iron, steels, uh, tungsten. Uh, at this point, essentially, you have the creation of uh, 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 line defects, like uh, you know, uh, dislocations and things like that. There will be basically these locations moving around, uh, forming knots between them. It's a very, very complex uh, uh, problem. So this is very difficult, essentially cannot be studied uh, today. Uh, using kind of DFT methods. So we concentrate on the linear elasticity region. And to make an example of which solids belong to which category, let's consider the uh, 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 compound that we've been discussing so far, that's silicon. So what I'm showing here is just a plot of a boneless stick model of uh, silicon, okay? And uh, so what you see here, in kind of greenish, I guess, is uh, uh, isosurface of the electron density. OK, calculated using the FT. So what you can see here, basically, is that the electron density uh, is extremely concentrated in the middle of the bonds. So that's what uh, people call directional bonding. Uh, and that's basically uh, the, the main cause of brittle fracture. So what happens, basically, is that if you break a bond, you really open up this structure. Uh, the opposite example is, uh, for instance, tungsten, which is a ductile uh, metal. So if you look at tungsten, basically, and you plot the electron density, what you see, actually, it is not concentrated on bonds, but it's actually a bit everywhere. Okay? It's like a glue, which is there everywhere. So this actually should ring a bell, because it's the picture that uh, people tell us about metallic bonding, where uh, you know, in high school or things like that. It's pretty much like that. So the electron density is a bit everywhere. So if you break a bond here, the density is still going to be there, so you don't really destroy the material. So that's why. Uh, 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 so they behave very, very differently. So the origin is really this directionality and the localization of the electron density in the bonds. So that's basically a, a distinction. And, but at this point, so in, the, in this region, there is basically no formal difference. So you can use the same rules for both. Okay? What is going to change is the numerical values of the elastic constants. So now to, uh, what I would like to do is to introduce uh, a, a recipe for calculating elastic constants. Uh, but without, uh, so uh, I don't want to give you a, a formal proof. I just would like to propose a way to understand it, which is very, very simple and also very uh, simple to remember. Okay? Uh, suppose you want to uh, look at the uh, young modulus okay, of uh, uh, a crystal of silicon. Uh, 
so the way we imagine it from textbooks is that you know you take this crystal and you stretch it, all right? And then at that point, you want to relate the stress to the strain. So basically, the, the, the Young modulus is the ratio between stress and strain. So if you could do a measurement, so actually you can do a measurement where you, you, you strain it and then you measure the stress with a piezo actuator or something like that, you can get this number. So what we can try to do, instead of going towards formal definitions uh, uh, right away, we can try to do uh, the same experiment on a computer. So that's what uh, I did here. Um, so what this is, basically, is a slab of silicon. Okay? So imagine this to be uh, identical to what uh, I showed you for the STM uh, uh, calculation. So it's a slab of silicon, very simply. Nothing complicated. So this has been completely relaxed. So you have to imagine that the atoms are at equilibrium. Okay? The forces on each atom are zero. So nothing uh, is happening at this point. So what I want to do is do a computer experiment where I stretch the slab and I try to calculate uh, you know, the, the stress. So the idea is very simple. Uh, the way I did it, uh, and you could try to repeat the calculation if you have time these days, is not in the exercise, but it's very, very easy to do. So basically what I did is to uh, basically move these atoms, so the top layer, you know, up by, so taking basically this height and multiply adding 5%, like height times 1.5. So I moved that, all right? And maybe I move also the second layer, just not to break everything. Uh, and then I relax the structure using the techniques that we will look at today. So essentially, you try to minimize the forces. You try to find the equilibrium configuration under the constraint that these atoms at the bottom don't move and the atoms at the top don't move. Okay? So you just keep them immobile and you let everything else relax. So at the end of the story, what happens is that all the atoms uh, in the structure will have found the, uh, uh, an equilibrium position. And what you see here is the relaxed structure. So as you can expect, uh, you know, it's just a, a uniform stretch of the, of the system along the Z direction. So there is nothing really uh, complicated. It's, you just stretch, relax, and you get the, the structure. Now, let's think of what is happening. If you look actually uh, inside the, the, the code, today we will look at uh, outputs where you find the forces on the atoms, OK? We will discuss that a second after lunch. Um, so if you do that operation for this system, what we will discover is that the forces on this atom, this atom, this atom, this atom, this atom, they're all zero. So it's all equilibrium. The force on these atoms at the top, and those at the bottom, the, which I kept fixed, they are actually non-zero, and they go in this direction. So basically, the top layer would like to go down, and the bottom layer feels uh, an attraction towards the top. So that simply means that that was the equilibrium. It's been stretched, so the system would like to go back to the equilibrium configuration, OK? It cannot because uh, I can just impose that the position of this atom cannot change. So I just keep them there. So physically, what it means, I mean, apart from the fact that in the code you can set the position of the atoms, what it means is that in order to keep, so if this ha experience a force downward, to keep it there, there must be a, a balancing force upwards. So that means what we calculate in a code is the internal force coming from all the electrons and the atoms. And uh, in order to keep it there, you need an external force, which goes the other way around. So what this physical picture means is that when you want to exp uh, expand it like that, there must be some forces acting on these atoms here and here to keep it like that. Did you have a question? Yeah. Did you consider splitting the chain? Yes. Okay. So basically, the z-coordinate is set to this value, let's say. Uh -huh. So that's. Can they move around the way? In principle, they can. In practice, they will not by symmetry. So they, they can. They explore basically the, the uh, potential energy, let's say, the plane. But nothing can change because essentially you, they still have to. So they, they feel the symmetry of the whole lattice, essentially. Uh, but yeah, in, pr in principle, everything is, is relaxed. So at this point, what happens is that, uh, is, so once we have that, we have a measure of the deformation. And we can actually look into the code for the forces of, uh, of uh, acting on these atoms. No, 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 there is no Poisson. So this is basically a, a, a very simple case where take this lab change the z-coordinates of some atoms, okay? Okay, and you're not saying yeah, that no, no. I have a corresponding... No, 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 no. Like so that. I'm not looking at that. That, that this is just a simple example. I mean, okay. so it's... Uh, it's uh, so the, that thing is something we will discuss uh, in a few slides. So that's basically the simplest thing. You can just, you just stretch it and see what happens. Uh, so what I, I try to say is that here you have forces to keep this thing uh, uh, in this uh, configuration, and you have a measure of the strain. So what you can do now is to use the definition of uh, stress and strain that we learned in high school, okay? So what that is, you take the 
uh, the, uh, uh, a certain kind of sample. If you stretch it by a certain amount, so that's the height, delta height, you can measure the forces. So the stress is the total external forces uh, divided the uh, area uh, upon which the forces are acting. Uh, and the strain is the basically relative uh, elongation. So it would be delta H divided by H. So we have s stress and strain defined as uh, in high school, okay? So from that, we can define the Young modulus, like proportionality coefficient, that's it. So from the code, what we can tell is the following. Uh, I used a transverse size of silicon of uh, 7.6 angstroms. So basically it's, uh, you know, it's a two by two uh, unit cell of silicon, okay? So the transverse area is uh, this number square, all right? Then I have in this uh, 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 calculation, I had four atoms per, per, uh, per unit cell in each plane. So like in the previous example of STM. And uh, in each, on each atom, I read from the code a force of 0.68 electromo uh, electromoles per angstrom. So what I need to do to get the stress is to multiply the force by the number of atoms and divide by the square of this number, okay? So that gives me a stress, which is 7.5 GPA, okay? As simple as that. So that's uh, the stress in this uh, kind of configuration here, all right? The term is force per unit area. Now, the strain is 5% because I elongated the, this thing by 5%, so that's, that's it. So now if you take the ratio between stress and strain, you get the Young modulus uh, you know, of this slab, 150 gigapascal, and if you compare to experiment, it's 166, okay? So that's basically a very simple way to discuss this kind of properties. Again, so deviation is about 10%, and I mean, this is just an example to show that there is nothing complicated about calculations of elastic constants. I mean, uh, DFT is really a way to calculate forces and total energies. Once uh, you, you understood that, and once you take that into account, you can do a lot of things. Okay. So this is just one example. You stretch something, you read the forces, you get the stress, and from that you can do elastic constants. Uh, the catch is that this is a very uh, 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 coarse, this, uh, this approximation. So, you know, the problem is that basically, you see, I'm doing a calculation, uh, and I'm trying to determine the Young modulus using a slab. So the question one can ask is, uh, okay, how big, the, you know, how thick the slab has to be? Because really I would like to, so the experiments typically are on uh, uh, crystalline silicon, uh, maybe like 300 microns, or something like that. So how thick has this slab to be to get an accurate number? So, well, ideally I would like something which is very large, but the calculation becomes uh, uh, horrendously uh, complicated. And if I take something small, because I don't want to spend too much time, maybe I can take, you know, just two layers, but that's almost like a bunch of molecules, it's not silicon anymore. So there is really a, a problem there, how to define uh, the Young modulus or the elastic constants of a bulk system as opposed to a slab. Also because here we have exposed surfaces, you could use that or you could have reconstructed surface, you could have uh, hydrogen passivation. Uh, the final number will depend on what you're doing on the surface because you know, the, you know, the, the, the effect of surface will be quite important in something so small. Okay? So you don't want that, that to happen. So one would like really to have calculations which depend only on the properties of the bulk system in the crystalline unit cell, not on slabs. So to do that, actually, there is a, a simple way to proceed, and basically is to use uh, something uh, 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 which is in like physics 101. It's called the work energy theorem, uh, and that's basically a, a property of classical mechanics. So that basically says that uh, the work of all the external forces on a system has to equal the change of basically of potential energy and kinetic energy of the system. Okay, uh, so when you talk about elasticity, we are talking about external actions on the system, right? So what, uh, why this is useful? Well, this is useful because in this situation we considered, okay, when you expand this lab, you start from a system equi equilibrium, so kinetic energy is zero. So you end up with a system that after a long time has relaxed, so kinetic energy is zero again. So what we find is that the work of all the external forces is simply equal to the change of the total potential energy. So kinetic, kinetic energy doesn't matter. So because of that, now we can uh, uh, play games and for instance, just to rewrite this in a way which is uh, more uh, interesting from the point of view of elasticity. So I can divide and multiply by the area. So this force divided by the area times the area. Maybe I can look at here as well. 
I can divide and multiply by the height. So dz divided h by times h. So this a times h gives me the volume of this love. And uh, if you look at that, the force, total force divided by area is the stress. And the dz divided by h is the differential strain. So that can be rewritten as the volume, which I call omega, times uh, the integral of uh, stress times dE, the epsilon, okay? This is basically the, the, the strain. That's basically just what comes out of the simple definition we use there. There is nothing uh, complicated. Now, the bit uh, uh, which is important is to say that we make the assumption that we are in linear elasticity, okay? So we are uh, considering uh, this part of the diagram I showed you before where everything is linear. If that is the case, I can make the assumption that the stress is a, a constant times the strain, okay? So it's a linear function of the strain. If I do that, and I call this constant capital C, I replace that by C times the strain times D is uh, strain, okay? And that now can be uh, uh, solved, uh, I mean, integrated uh, trivially because we will have uh, epsilon squared divided by two. So we find out basically that the change in potential energy is basically the elastic constant times strain squared. See, as simple as that. So why this is useful? If I now take the derivative of the expression with respect to the strain, I found, find the, uh, the stress, okay, by definition, because that gives me C times strain, and that by definition is my stress. That's the first relation. The second relation is that if I take the second derivative, I kill the strain here, and therefore I find the elastic constant. So by using an extremely simple reasoning, as you can see, just taking a slab, so that's something we, we could have done after physics 101. There is no DFT here, there is no quantum mechanics. We are just saying that if you have a material and you can calculate the total potential energy surface, the derivative with respect to the strain gives you the stress, tense, the stress, and the second derivative gives you the elastic constant. So that is the way people calculate elastic properties in DFT. They, they map out the total energy uh, surface and they take first derivatives for the stress and second derivatives for the elastic constant. That's it. So that's all you really need to, to remember, basically, I mean, if you want to do these calculations. So clearly here, I'm using a, a, a simplification because you know, in a standard material, you know, if you put a stress okay, which goes uh, 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 this way, you may have strain in other directions. So for instance, Julie before mentioned the, you know, basically Poisson contraction. Well, that's uh, uh, something that is there. It has to be taken into account. So the way to take that into account is to generalize all these things you know, beyond the case of uh, cubic isotropic uh, perfect materials, going to the most general case where the strain can be anything and therefore the stress can be anything. And uh, we go from scalars to tensors, okay? So that's a bit awful, but that's the way it is. And uh, I need to say that this has nothing to do with me or DFT. That has been invented by people who do uh, mechanics, solid mechanics. So this is something in principle I could just skip because I assume you know that better than I do because I never did really uh, uh, solid mechanics. There's something that people do in mechanical engineering, probably do every day for breakfast, but basically the way it goes is that to define the most general deformation of a solid, uh, the way to do it is to say any atomic position, so this would be uh, the position of the atom I in the Cartesian direction alpha, that could be X, Y, or Z, is rewritten as the old position, Kronecker delta times the old position, plus uh, something else, okay? The something else is a, uh, a, some kind of linear combinations of the previous positions, and this linear combination is called the strain tensor. So this is of the order of one along the diagonal, and this is uh, of the order maybe of 1%, 2%, 3%. So this is a very small number. So this is not something that I made up. This is a definition of strain in the most general case, okay? If you go to any elasticity textbook, that's what you will find. So the, the actual meaning of that is that if you have four atoms here, I don't know, a naught, a one, a two, and a three, and you define some uh, kind of strain tensor, that will deform going somewhere else, that will deform, this will deform. So you go from a shape to another shape, and the, the final shape can be anything, okay? So by using this tensor notation, you can go from a cube to something which looks not, nothing like a cube, okay? So you have all the information possible here. So again, I don't want to spend too much time there because it's not really the real mod DFT. This is actually standard uh, uh, solid mechanics. And uh, at this point, if the strain tensor, so the strain has become a tensor now to define all possible deformations, 
you can imagine that when you take derivatives of the potential energy surface with respect to a tensor, you also obtain a stress, which is also a tensor. That's why people talk about strain tensor and stress tensor. The complication at this point is the following, that if we look at that, basically the elastic constants are a second derivative with respect to the strain. In this case, it's a scalar. If the strain becomes a, 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 a tensor, the situation gets messier. So the, 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 the total energy surface will be essentially expanded as a quadratic form of the strain. So you have twice the strain tensor. And the proportionality coefficient is no longer one constant, capital C, but is a tensor of uh, rank 4. That means C, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So each of those is a Cartesian coordinate. So how many constants there are? 3 to the power of 4, 81 uh, 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 elastic constants. Okay? So that's clearly getting quite messy. Uh, but uh, there are good news. So things are not as difficult in general. Uh, so let me make, for instance, uh, one uh, observation. When you look at this uh, kind of deformation, that describes any possible change of shape of a solid. Okay? So which is not uh, very interesting because it captures also the case where you go from a situation like that, suppose a square, to a situation which looks like this, which is basically the square rotated, let's say, by a certain angle. So with that kind of tensor, you can describe the situation. Well, that's not elasticity. That's just a rotation. Okay? So that's not very interesting. So if you look at the maths, so if you, I mean, in the book, I try to explain that uh, in a few words. If you look at the maths, what you discover is that basically the, the symmetric part of this tensor, so this plus this transpose divided by 2, describes a, a deformation. The anti-symmetric part, so the tensor minus its transpose divided by 2, defines, describes rotations. So what people do is to say, if I want to elasticity, I get rid of rotations, and I only focus on the symmetric part, which describes pure deformations okay, of the solid, so without global rotations. Because of that, the strain tensor, the one which is used for this kind of deformations, is basically taken to be symmetric. That means you have a diagonal, then you have epsilon xx, y, y, z, z, then x, y, x, z, y, z. On the other side, this has to be equal to that, this has to be equal to that, and the same here. Okay? So maybe let me just uh, ask out of curiosity, how many people did already see this very carefully uh, in undergrad? Fantastic. So at least half. So since we have six elements here, okay, what people do is say, instead of you know, uh, keeping x, y, x, z, y, z, and all that, let's simplify. So there is something which is called the Volk notation, which is the following. I rename this guy as epsilon 1, this guy as epsilon 2. So I go in an uh, anti anti-clockwise fashion like that. So epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's just a way to call things. There is nothing really. But what is important here is that the strain tensor now has only six elements. So if there are only six elements and I go back to this expression, these are six elements, these are six elements, I can expect that the, the, the elastic constants will have 36 elements in total, not 81. So that's precisely what happens. What people do is to write that, and this object will have six uh, to the power of two elements, uh, 36 elements, okay? I changed epsilon into u, this is called the engineering strain, it's just a convention. If you don't do that, since you are, have the diagonal once and the off-diagonal twice, you will get some weird constants here. So to avoid that, people define the engineering strain along the off-diagonal as twice the, the physics uh, strain. So it's just a convention. Uh, I didn't invent it. Sorry for that. But the point is that the good news is that the elastic constants are only 36 elements. And you can prove that that uh, uh, actually is also a symmetric tensor, so only one, so the diagonal and one half matter. The other half has to be equal to the, uh, to the upper half. And that's simply because we are doing, so if you look at that, we are doing second derivatives. So the second derivative with respect to x and y and with respect to y and x have to be equal, right? You can exchange the order. Because of that, the, the elastic constant tensor has to be symmetric. So the, the, the good news is that only 21 elastic constants are completely independent. And for any material with 21 elastic constants, you can define completely the elasticity, okay? So now 21 is a lot. Uh, uh, so uh, we will not study that for uh, uh, you know, crazy systems with 21 independent elastic constants. We will consider only cubic systems today. Uh, guess which system? Silicon. Uh, 
And uh, uh, in that case, basically, what you find out is that there are only uh, a few elastic constants which are non-zero. That these are called C11, C12, and C44. Everything else here is zero. This is zero. This is zero and zero. C44 is on the diagonal. C11 and 2 are here. This is also C12, C12, the same here, here, here. And C01 is on the diagonal here. So basically, only three numbers completely define the elasticity in a cubic system. Okay? So this is not something that I invented. There are uh, uh, books and books on uh, precisely which elastic constants are non-zero in which kind of uh, 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 system or brave lattice or something that you want. So that's something that you find in, in, in tables. Uh, now, I just want to uh, give you a flavor of how people could calculate uh, elastic constants, OK? So the way they do, OK, let me go back a second, is just to use this relation. So once we found a, 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 a relation, uh, uh, analytically, let's say from theory, at that point we can go with calculations and uh, try to determine the parameters we want. So what this is saying basically is that the change of the total potential energy will be essentially, let's say, a quadratic function of these deformations. So what people do is to take the equilibrium structure, enforce a deformation, so set these two values, suppose, any choice that you like, look for the change of total potential energy, and from this equation, extract the lattice constant. OK? As simple as that. So clearly, there are many parameters, many, many, many elastic constants. So what people do is to consider several cases. For a cubic system, we have three uh, independent elastic constants. So you can guess that you can do three different deformations of the system, calculate the total energy, and extract these lattice constants. So the one, we will, so the, the three deformations we consider today is the, are the following. One is the isotropic deformation. You take the system, you just expand it uh, isotropically along the three uh, uh, lattice parameters, A1, A2, and A3. You just suppose you put a stretch of 5% along these uh, three lattice parameters. So you get something bigger. If you use this constraint in this expression, okay, if you choose carefully the, 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 the strain Basically, the element of the strain tensor, which gives you isotropic deformation, that means you have no shear, so no off-diagonal, and these three things are identical. What you end up with is a simplified version of this equation, which reads like that. It's going to be C11 plus twice C12 times this, let's say, 5% square here. So that means if I expand the structure, the lattice, let's say by 2% or 5%, and I do a calculation of the total energy, I will get this value. If I divide now the change in total energy, by the expansion parameter, I get the sum of C11 and twice C12. So that's one relation I need. Second relation, as you can guess, is a tetragonal deformation. That's what Julie was asking before. I stretch basically along one direction, and I compress along the other two directions. Okay? So in the, and these two things are related by the essentially something like a Poisson ratio, which, where you conserve the volume. You go, basically, you do minus a certain amount in two directions and twice the same amount along the third direction. If you put these uh, constraints together in the previous general equation here, what you found, find is the change of total energy is something which is, again, depends quadratically on the expansion parameter, but this time there is the difference between C11 and C12. So here we have two equations. One gives us the, 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 the sum of these two constants and one gives us the difference. So if you can do these two calculations, by putting together, you can determine C11 and C12. It's just simple maths. So there's a remaining constant, which is C44. That's the most ugly, because you need to do essentially a trigonal deformation where things are not uh, uh, nicely tetragonal. You need to, uh, to kill the system a bit. So the way you do is basically going for the uh, 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 basically uh, shear deformation. Okay? And uh, if you do the maths again, you find that uh, the only constant which appears in the expression is C44, and you can determine that. So today we have some exercises where these three things are done, I think, for the case probably of uh, uh, diamond. And actually, we will see that there will be an example on the long sought after uh, uh, STO uh, in this case. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at that point, yeah. But for STO, since things are messy, we will only do the, you know, the, the first one, the isotropic compression. Otherwise, uh, we'll spend here uh, 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 the night. Uh, so this is to give you a, a, a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of uh, com you know, examples of comparison between the calculations and the experiment. Uh, so these are calculations I've done for uh, uh, silicon. And here I'm just putting down uh, a picture from Wikipedia 
just to say that actually there is quite some interest now in looking at the elastic constant silicon, which one may think oh, that's the oldest material in the world. Nobody cares about silicon anymore, that's true. But uh, <laughs> we will delete that. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, basically, uh, since uh, you know, the processing is very advanced now, basically it's easy to, uh, it's easy. It is possible to, do, to look, you know, to form things like uh, micromechanical cantilevers. So it's very nice for, you know, I don't know, piezo properties or, you know, resonators. So uh, in this application, one has to know very carefully the, the, the elastic constants because by using that you can de determine vibrational frequencies of these bars and things like that. So if you look at calculations, uh, uh, DFTLDA gives me 161 for uh, C11 and experiment is 165, so it's 3%. C12 is 6264, 3%, and this is a bit 2%. So the, the agreement is quite good. Uh, is not always the case. Typically, the agreement in elastic constant is the order of 10%. So this is a fortunate case, okay? Um, if we take now uh, 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 tungsten, uh, the other example I showed at the beginning, uh, here I'm giving a slightly different measure, which is C11 plus twice C12. That's a response to isotropic compression. So that's also called a bulk modulus. It's basically the tendency of a material to resist to compression, okay? The higher bulk modulus, the less you can compress it. So tungsten is one of the elements with the highest bulk modulus. I think b above tungsten, there is probably only diamond uh, 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 with the highest bulk modulus, and maybe boron nitride. Um, and basically, here we get 328. Experiment is 314, and the error is uh, 4%. So also in this case, things are pretty good. But remember, these are very good cases where DFT performs very well, OK? So this is not always the, 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 the case. That's basically the best uh, 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 you can get. Now, I just have two. A uh, uh, couple of final slides. Uh, what I want to tell you is that uh, the elastic constants can be uh, calculated by essentially deforming the structure and using these equations. Okay, that's a possibility. Uh, there is another uh, approach which is smarter, but it's uh, uh, it's more involved uh, from the conceptual point of view. So people have been working on that for a long time, and they found uh, uh, new strategies. So what one can do is to calculate the stress tensor directly from a calculation without deforming the system. And that's essentially using perturbation theory. That's called the, the, the stress theorem. And so this is basically the same Richard Martin of the book that I was mentioning at the beginning, is uh, Urbana Champagne. Uh, so this stress theorem basically allows you to calculate stress in the system without deforming the, the structure. And today in the tutorials, you will see that if you compress something, the code can give you the stress. And you can tell, oh, wow, this is really under compression. So I need to, to, to maybe do a better job in relaxing it. The, the good news about having stress is not just oh, I want to see the stress, is that once you have a, a, a theoretical tool to calculate stress inside the code, uh, clearly you can imagine that you can try and do a calculation under a finite stress. Okay? That means, for instance, that includes hydrostatic pressure. So if you want to do a calculation on any of these materials at 300 gigapascal, it's, you know, in DFT it's trivial. That's uh, something we discussed, uh, uh, I guess, uh, at the very beginning when I gave you, gave you examples. And people were looking at uh, uh, you know, the melting temperature of a uh, curve of iron in the, at the condition of the Earth uh, core. Uh, you know, doing calculations of iron at 350 gigapascal is possible and is very easy with DFT. The calculation is not more expensive. It's just basically uh, a, an extra term in the Hamiltonian, uh, which is the, contains the stress. Okay? So that's why this is very important. So that's something that um, uh, it's increasingly popular to study uh, materials under uh, extreme conditions. Okay? So whenever people uh, do now uh, diamond unmill experiments, typically there is somebody doing calculations with them uh, uh, to, to see uh, uh, you know, what uh, uh, is uh, uh, going on. And you know, for instance, a lot of work recently on the hydrides, so the high uh, temperature uh, uh, superconducting hydrides, DFT calculations were very important to try to find out what could be the, the, you know, the, the actual phase of that, those uh, kind of hydrides at those high pressures. I mean, it would be very different to, to establish that, difficult to establish that uh, without these calculations. And uh, this is basically just a, a, a cartoon thing where I want to show you one example where this calculation under uh, finite uh, uh, pressure have been very useful in the, in, in the past. That's another example for uh, planetary physics. Uh, so what you're looking at here, basically, on the, so on the right is a cross-section of uh, you know basically the, this planet, so we are basically here, okay. And as you go deep inside, you have various layers, okay. You have the crust, uh, the mantle, you know the, man the the boundary between core and mantle. This is the outer core that we discussed on day one. This is the inner core, 
And just to give you an example, so I told you on day one that the inner core is solid and is iron, and this is liquid. So how do people figure that out? By basically uh, uh, cross-matching uh, uh, seismic data from various parts on, on you know, positions on this planet, they essentially mapped out the uh, distribution of elastic constants uh, in, inside the planet, okay? And uh, uh, for instance, they could tell that this is liquid because the uh, uh, longitudinal waves, they, they do propagate here, that's uh, the, the sound velocity, but the shear waves, uh, basically the velocity goes to zero in this region, so there is only one place where shear waves don't propagate, is either, I mean two places, liquids and uh, you know, gas. So either it's gas, but it's unlikely, or it's liquid. Uh, so this is basically liquid iron. And now what I would like to discuss is this region here. That has been actually quite famous in, uh, I don't know, that was 2005, I suppose. Uh, basically, uh, uh, this region is called the D second layer. It's basically at the intersection between the core and the uh, mantle. And uh, essentially, pretty much every single material across the, this uh, kind of section is known. People have studied that a lot. So, uh, you know, earth science uh, has gone a long way. And there was a, re a remaining controversy about the, the, you know, the composition and the structures in this layer. So what people know is that here, most of the materials, so most, the largest percentage uh, uh, comes from magnesium uh, uh, silicate, okay, which is a perovskite structure. What was happening here is that people in this region, you cannot see, but in this region, there was essentially a very significant uh, anisotropy of the propagation of sound, essentially, uh, at that, uh, up to this point, people were, uh, were recording uh, uh, isotropic materials. At this point, it happened that before moving to iron, liquid iron, everything becomes anisotropic. And there were various speculation of why that happens. Um, so what I need to tell you is that here the pressure is basically about 130 gigapascal, okay? So what people did here is calculations to see what is the stable phase of magnesium silicate at those pressure. And what they found basically, if this shows up, is that, let um, me show you here, that this is the difference basically in enthalpy between the stretch on the left and that on the right. So what this plot means is that when you hit zero, these two phases are equally uh, basically likely. On this side, basically, this phase becomes uh, 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 essentially the ground state, okay? So what that means is that when you exceed like 99, 98 gigapascal, so the stable phase of this magnesium silicate is not the standard perovskite, but it's something which is called the post-perovskite, okay? And as you can see, so this is a layer material now, so you can guess anisotropic elastic constants. At the pressure of the, this layer here, it will be under 30 gigapascal. So according to DFT calculations, the stable phase at that point should not be this one, but should be this one. And if you calculate basically the, 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 the shear waves, uh, so the shear wave velocity uh, for this phase, that is basically in better agreement with experiment than this one. So that was basically an assignment of the structure of this layer. And that was quite important because you know, the DFT calculation has played a very, very important role here. So that was done at uh, University College uh, 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 London, this work. So this actually mm, uh, it shows you that actually if you can do calculations under extreme pressure, you can get information which would be very difficult to get experimentally because you know you need to probe materials which are you know two thousand two two kilometers, no what two thousand kilometers, uh, below the surface. Okay, so that's basically the I would say the end of today's lectures, and what we're going to try to do in the afternoon is to see how to uh, optimize structures uh, automatically. Okay, the first bit, and the second bit how to calculate some uh, elastic constants. Okay.